brief introduction to all the official constellations. Part 12 of 88. Kansa. The constellation, not the disease, although they do share an etymology. So Cancer is one of the 12 zodiac constellations, which you can see because the ecliptic here passes right through it, and it is a northern constellation. It's named after the crab that the goddess Hera sent to defeat Heracles, who she wasn't a big fan of. It's a medium-sized constellation, but relatively dim. In fact, the second dimmest of the zodiac constellations. This star here, Beta Cancri, is its brightest star, and it's only three and a half magnitude. And this star right here, Delta Cancri, is known for having the longest known star name, which I'm not even going to try to pronounce. <laughs> but it means the southeast star in the crab in ancient Babylonian. There are a lot of really cool objects in Cancer, including this beautiful cluster called Messier 44, or the Beehive Cluster, which is visible to the naked eye and is in a nearby young open cluster. Part 13 of 88, Canis Venatici, aka the Hunting Dogs. And these hunting dogs, which names are Asterion and Chara, belong to Buotes the Huntsman, which is the next door constellation. And they look nothing like dogs, they're actually just a single star each. And the name actually comes from a mistranslation of club to dogs when going from Greek to Arabic to Latin. This is a northern constellation of middling size that's tucked in between Buotes and Ursa Major and has generally pretty faint stars. And it was designated as a con constellation back in 1687. The brightest star in the constellation, Cor Caroli, which is the dog Asterion, is named in honor of King Charles I and is a relatively nearby binary star. It also contains La Superba, which is a carbon star and is one of the reddest known stars, and despite being only 1.6 times the mass of the sun, is 352 times the radius of the sun. Canis includes some really cool deep sky objects, including the Whirlpool Galaxy. Part 14, 88. Canis Major, the greater dog. And this one actually kind of looks like a dog. In this case, it's one of two dogs that are following Orion the Hunter, and this one is in pursuit of Lepus the Hare. This is a southern constellation, but not very far south, so it can actually be seen as far north as 60 degrees of latitude at certain points in the year. Canis Major has very many bright stars, most notably its brightest star, Sirius, which is actually the brightest star besides the sun that we can see. Sirius is actually a binary star. This is its brightest component, the A star. And then this little dot is a white dwarf companion. That's the B component. And while Sirius is much brighter than the sun, the reason that it's the brightest star we can see is because it's actually relatively nearby. It's less than nine light years away. In addition to its bright stars, Canis Majors contains several bright open clusters, including M41, the little beehive cluster. Part 15 of 88, Canis Minor. That's right, we had the greater dog and now we have the lesser dog. Although interestingly, these two constellations, though their companions, don't actually border one another. There's another constellation in between them. Like its sibling constellation, Canis Minor is also a dog that is following the hunter Orion. However, unlike Canis Major, Canis Minor doesn't actually look anything like a dog. It's literally just two stars connected by a line. Artistic license. Canis Minor is ever so slightly a northern constellation, but it can actually be seen as far south as 75 degrees. As the name suggests, Canis Minor is actually a very small constellation. At just 183 square degrees, there are only 17 constellations that are smaller. However, it still contains one of the brightest stars in the night sky, Procyon. Procyon is actually a binary star consisting of an F star and a white dwarf, and it's the eighth brightest star because it's only about 11 and a half light years away. The other bright star in Canis Minor is called Gomiza. There aren't very many deep sky objects in Canis Minor, but take a moment for this beautiful planetary nebula, Able 24. Part 16 of 88, Capricornus, the goat. Not the greatest of all time, but the horned goat, although it's actually more commonly depicted as a sea goat with the tail of a fish, because why not? This actually dates back to ancient Babylonian mythology. Capricornus is one of the 12 zodiac constellations that falls along the ecliptic, which is the sun's apparent path through the night sky over the course of a year. And yes, the official constellation name is Capricornus, with an us. Capricornus is a slightly southern constellation of middling size, and it lends its name to the Tropic of Capricorn because back in the day, the winter solstice used to occur in this constellation. It doesn't anymore because of possession. A relatively faint constellation, its brightest star, Deneb el Gidi, doesn't even crack the top 100 brightest stars in the night sky. Capricornus contains a couple notable globular clusters like M30, and this gorgeous group of three interacting galaxies called the Hickson Compact Group 87. There are also several meteor showers originating in this constellation, most notably the Alpha Capricornids, part 17 of 88, Carina, or Carina aka the keel, because it actually used to be part of a larger constellation, a ship called Argo Navis. But this constellation was so monstrously huge that they've actually split it up into three separate constellations, including Carina, 
the keel. And even so, Carina is still the 34th largest constellation. The ship itself comes from the myth of Jason and the Argonauts, who searched for the Golden Fleece. Carina is quite a southern constellation. It can actually only be seen up to 20 degrees north. It's also a pretty bright constellation. Its brightest star here, Alpha Carina or Canopus, is actually the second brightest star in the night sky. Canopus is considered the rudder of the great ship, and it's a huge star about eight times as massive as the sun that's already nearing the end of its life. Speaking of big stars, Carina also contains the star Eta Carinae, which is actually a binary star of two massive stars. One is about 90 times the mass of the sun, and the other is about 30 times the mass of the sun. Eta Carinae actually had this huge ejection almost 200 years ago, which created this a very cool structure called the Homunculus Nebula. And the Homunculus Nebula is part of a much larger nebula that we could not possibly forget about because the Carina Nebula was a fan favorite of JWST images. It's part 18 of 88. Cassiopeia! That's right, it's the big W. Okay, it does look like a W, but it's actually meant to be a queen sitting on her throne. Well, sitting is a nice way of putting it. She's actually chained to that throne as a punishment from Poseidon. So this is the Queen Cassiopeia of Ethiopia from Greek mythology. We actually already met her daughter Andromeda in the first entry of this series. Cassiopeia is a decently large constellation at almost 600 square degrees, and it's quite far north. In fact, Cassiopeia is one of the five circumpolar constellations of the northern hemisphere, which basically means that it does not set throughout the year, it is always visible. While none of the individual stars of Cassiopeia are notably bright, the brightest is about the 70th brightest star in the night sky, the fact that these five main stars of the asterism are very clearly visible and the constellation is present throughout the year makes us a very well-known constellation. Besides stars, Cassiopeia contains some very cool objects, including Tycho's supernova back in 1572, which is now Tycho's supernova remnant, another supernova remnant from an even older supernova, also this beauty, the Bubble Nebula, and the well-named Pac-Man Nebula. <laughs> Part 19 of 88, Centaurus the Centaur, named for the half-horse, half-man creature of Greek mythology and actually one of two centaur constellations because apparently that's what we need in the sky. Centaurus is the ninth largest constellation, and it's a southern constellation visible only up to 25 degrees north. In fact, the two brightest stars of Centaurus can actually be used as a pointer to locate the Southern Cross, which Centaurus kind of wraps around. These two stars are Alpha and Beta Centauri, and Alpha Centauri is not only the third brightest star in the entire night sky, but it's also the closest stellar system to us. Alpha Sen is actually a triple star system, though only the two brightest stars are actually visible by eye. The dim third star is a red dwarf called Proxima Centauri, and it is the closest star to us and actually hosts rocky planets, including one in the habitable zone. Centaurus includes way too many cool objects to list them all here, including Omega Centauri, the largest and brightest globular cluster in the Milky Way and the so-called backwards galaxy, which is actually rotating in this direction despite the way the arms face. Part 19 of 88, Cepheus, the house. Okay, that's not actually real, but that's how I thought of it as a kid. <laughs> In actuality, Cepheus is a king of Ethiopia from Greek mythology. Remember we talked about Cassiopeia? Well, this is her hubby. Cepheus is one of the five northern circumpolar constellations, meaning it is visible year-round in the northern hemisphere and is actually only visible down to 10 degrees south latitude. Cepheus isn't a particularly bright constellation. Its brightest star, Alpha Cephei, barely even cracks the top 100. But fun fact, in about five, 6,000 years, Alpha Cephei will actually be the new North Pole star thanks to the precession of the Earth's axis. The most famous star in the constellation is probably Delta Cephei because that is the prototype for a class of stars called Cepheid variables, which are hugely important in helping us measure extragalactic distances. Some of the fun deep sky objects in Cepheus include the Fireworks Galaxy, because pretty, and the Wizard Nebula, because that's an awesome name, and this was discovered by Carolyn Herschel, was just a badass woman of astronomy. Part 21 of 88, Cetus, named for a sea monster of Greek mythology. Actually from the same story as we've seen from Cepheus, Andromeda, Cassiopeia. So basically, Cetus was the sea monster to whom Andromeda's parents were trying to sacrifice her, but spoiler alert, Perseus came along and killed him. Besides the sea monster, Cetus is sometimes called the whale, which is actually a pretty fitting name because it's the fourth largest constellation. Hopefully with better luck than some other cosmic whales I could think of. Cetus is a slightly southern constellation and actually just misses out on having the ecliptic pass through it by less than a quarter of a degree. 
The brightest star in Cetus is actually not Alpha Ceti, it is Beta Ceti. Bayer's designations, not an exact science. One of the most well-known stars of Cetus is the star Tau Ceti, which is the closest solar analog to us at less than 12 light years away, and it hosts a planetary system of at least five planets. Tau Ceti appears a lot in science fiction. <laughs> Probably in this day and age, most well known for being the main setting of Andy Weir's Project Hail Mary, but for me, it will always be Pell's star. Cetus also contains the most distant star ever seen, called a Rendell, at 28 billion light years away. Cetus doesn't contain many galactic deep sky objects, but it does have a lot of cool galaxies, like NGC 1073, this prominently barred spiral galaxy, and the interacting galactic system IC 1623 in the final stages of merging. Part 22 of 88. Chameleon, the chameleon. It was named by Dutch navigators in the 16th century, probably after the small, strange, color-changing lizard they saw on their trip to the East Indies. The lizard is said to be trying to eat the neighboring fly constellation Musca. This is a teeny little southern constellation. It's the 10th smallest, and it actually cannot be seen from the northern hemisphere at all. It's also quite dim. Its brightest star, Alpha Chameleontis, has a magnitude greater than 4. Remember, with magnitudes, greater means less bright. There are only like six-ish stars in Chameleon even visible by eye without really good conditions. But don't be fooled, this constellation still contains cosmic wonders. For example, HH909A is a protostar in the Chameleon 1 molecular cloud, which was caught here by Hubble in the final stages of becoming a star, and in the process emitting these bright narrow jets of gas away into space. Or the Reflection Nebula, IC 1631, where the bright blue light of a newborn star reflects off nearby dust. Or the beautiful bright planetary nebula, NGC 3195.